Welcome to Being Paleo. I'm Professor Amy Keeley, and thank you for joining me on my path and desire to return to a healthier pre-Socratic thinking and lifestyle. This is the mode where our paleo ancestors lived their lives with a different sense of community that was in balance and harmony with nature. I didn't say that they lived an easy life, but I did say that they lived a life much richer and smarter because it was in harmony with nature. Please visit beingpaleo.com for more information about my mission, goals, and experience, along with recipes and partnerships that can be a benefit to you in your life journey as well. The focus of Being Paleo is to explore paleo-archaic humans with a real attempt to peel away modern notions by celebrating those people who are currently doing an activity that is closer to how our paleo-archaic ancestors lived life. Through this genealogical search within epistemes, I will explore ideas and information on my journey to live authentically and by interviewing others who are trying to do the same. My hope is to find ways to shed this false modern narrative whose arsenal is built on the idea of, quote, progress that has failed despite promises that, quote, life will get better. It has not. And it is now being revealed in the chaotic entropy of destruction and disease that we modern humans have caused. Therefore, being paleo is about recreating an environment of proper stewardship based on ancient fellowship and community practices through lifestyle, food, and art, and within a different type of philosophy that has been lost to modern humans. When I say lost to modern humans and this knowledge that has been lost, what do I mean by that? I mean that there is information that is lost over time that we look back on even in the last generation and don't really understand fundamentally why they did certain things. And you look at it with a modern lens to say, well, that's archaic, uh, that makes no sense. Um, I don't understand why they did that. When the answer is very simple, there is a reason that they did that. And it made absolute sense at the time we just don't understand it because we don't have the experience they had when they invented it. And to discount that idea of why it was created or to think that we are enhancing it is to create chaos. And the beginning of understanding where we have gone wrong and what is entropy is to understand the notion of chaos. And I no longer think of chaos as a theory. I have started to refer to it as a principle, a principle which is something that it is, it is a fact. It can be measured over time. And that is what's entropy. Entropy is the destruction and the chaos left over that is unknowable and unmeasurable at that point. So meaning Chaos are small, minute changes on complex systems that create chaos, which means that you can do something so small that it has profound effects later on, and you can't know what it is going to cause later on. And that is the arrogance of modern man to think that they can control everything, fix everything, or know everything. And the answer is we know nothing, absolutely, profoundly nothing. And what we have done in the past, you know, I'd say the modern age, I define the modern age as really starting at the Middle Ages, where you know, uh, there was a effort to change what had been existing in society uh, for the for the quote betterment of society or the idea of making life easier and that to me becomes this notion of what is modern is the idea that you can make life easier life is not about being easy and that's why you hear a lot of people will say the journey and that's why I'm doing this podcast is in a way a reminder for myself to really continue to investigate, to continue to try to understand what ancient humans were doing and this return to hard work and this idea of 
easy or luxury is a fallacy. It is an absolute fallacy. And it's creating this toxic world soup that we live in by thinking that we can make anything easy. And it's, if, if you've learned nothing in life, profoundly, there are no shortcuts. Every time you take a shortcut, you have knowledge loss that you don't really understand. So to give an example in a very crude way of what I mean, my mother was the first female industrial engineer at Jenna Motors and it told me a story about how when they were transporting Riviera vehicles on flatbed trailers and lo car loaders that they used to steal the hubcaps uh, because they were valuable. And the decision was made after careful thought and investigation to put a lock on the hubcap to prevent it from being stolen in, trans in transit. And that worked beautifully. And then a young college kid came along, maybe 10, 20 years, looked at the, the lock and said, well, why on earth are these locks on here? They cost so much money and did a cost analysis of how much it cost to put the lock on there. And the decision was made over her objections to take the lock off because it would quote, save money. And what happened again? They started to be stolen again. And that just highlighted for me this idea that had, I guess, has been percolating in my brain is that we don't always really understand why something is in place, but we just want to change it just to change it. And there's a reason why it was there. And thinking that we can make it better is, is, a, is a mistake of profound proportions because all we do is make ourselves guinea pigs because most of what has been put in place has never been long-term tested. All this technology with iPhones and iPads and, and computers everywhere and digitized you know, um, advertising um, where it's music, and it's, it's, it, I mean, it combines all of your senses, music, smell, sound, it's never been long-term tested on human beings. But if you look at the state of human emotions, that is where, I hate to say it, but the rubber meets the road, is that we have human beings that exist on this planet only with heavy medication because they are anxious and they are depressed. And ask yourself, the very simple and profound question of why is it that ancient peoples were able to exist in life without necessarily modern medication and in some ways thrived because they had a stronger community. You know, um, we look at, I mean, life today is not really an existence when you have to be on medication. And that in the, is the heart of what is this notion of simple abundance is how can you simplify your needs to live an abundant life? And the answer for me has been understanding that simplify is to simplify it. It is to pare it down, take it back. Don't be involved in so many things that you stretch yourself too thin. Uh, I, the, the ideas of what you do um, are, are more simplified and less complex. You get up every day, you commune with nature, you have that moment of peace and solitude. And there's a book called Simple Abundance. Um, it's by Sarah Van Bresnick. Um, it's six, 365 days to a balanced and joyful life. And it was recommended to me. And I have purchased the book and have given it to friends. And the answer is that it's a number one, well, I guess I should qualify. It's a number one New York Times bestselling author who wrote the book and it's to live, it's to live in gratitude. And it's a profound thought. And it, you can tell after reading it um, and it's, it's based on the principles of the secret, which is if you, create a vision board 
of what it is that you want in your life. And it be you know, and it don't have to have a vision board, but you have to have a mental vision board and know exactly where you want to go and how you believe it so much that it will happen that you what they will say is sending out ideas and thoughts to the universe. But in a way, you're creating your own self-fulfilling prophecy because you are basically rewiring your brain to think differently. Is that if you keep these ideas in your fore mind, um, in your conscious brain, that you want them, you will make choices in your life that will help you fulfill your destiny. And so why do we create vision boards and why is a lot of people like Tony Robbins or you know Sarah advising you to create a vision board? And the reason is very simple, is that you can get lost in your daily life and forget to look and to think about all those things that you have in your mind that you want in your life. So keeping a vision board near you where you can look at it as a reminder, almost like a talisman where you just go back and you touch it to remind yourself of what it is that is really important to you or what you really want in life is, is, is critical in this day and age where you are so bombarded with information and ideas and, and thoughts and distractions from what it is that you claim that you really want in life. And so it becomes important to have something if you don't have it for yourself, this drive and determination to change your life, you have something that you can look back at and you can remind yourself that these are the things that are important to you. And these, this is the direction that you want your life to go into. And that becomes critical for changing your life. And the book I find to be very interesting. It's, it's laid out where every day is a, is a day of the week and it's maybe two, three pages that you read. And they're just enough to be, you know, mindful and keep you in a certain frame of mind. And it's also, there's always a quote uh, by a noted author that she uses um, to help frame what it is, is, is the thought for the day. And highly recommend the book if you haven't already heard about it or read it. Um, it's, it's an easy read, um, keeps you what she calls towards your authentic self. And for me, my authentic self, what I have learned is that I have a very strong moral compass which means that if there's a law out there, I follow the law. If I don't like the law, then I work to get the law changed. But I don't just ignore it just because I don't like it. And that is something profound in a civilized society that you have to have rule of law, um, especially in public places where you have people convening. And especially in a day and age where we see rights, the rights and freedoms that are afforded to US citizens colliding, like the freedom of speech is colliding with the freedom of religion. We have the state that is taking over parenting, whether it's child protective services or the educational system that's taking over the role of the parent. And in some ways the parent will willingly give it up. And in some cases they go down fighting to, for their child's education to be a more traditional education and not more of a modern um, education. And we see this fighting in our society for progress versus traditional conservative values. And for the people that are progressive, I mean, I can't say that I don't understand why they're not wanting progress because they think that they've been sold a bill of goods that progress is gonna make everything better. But if they took a moment and they looked at how long we as modern humans have been promised that progress is, will make life easier, it goes back even further back, but just look at the 1950s. 
we were told that technology would take us to the moon and it would make us much better people and life would become easier for us and and harmony and you know all these notions of how great technology was going to be without the understanding is that they said that so you would buy their products but somebody clamped onto that idea of progress is better but ask yourself in this moment in time with children mass shooting in schools that by the way did not start until the 1990s there's only one school shooting on record and there was a specific reason for it in the 1800s but from the 1800s to 1990 there was not one school shooting so ask ourselves what happened in the 1990s or leading up to the 1990s that has profoundly shaped children's minds so that they feel either to get attention or to take out as many kids because they're miserable when that became okay and what caused it. Is it, you know, guns? And, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm a, I have a gun. I grew up around guns. I'm not afraid of guns. Um, I've been taught a healthy respect for guns. I am concerned about the people who haven't been taught um, to be around guns. Um, they are uncomfortable, but that's why you, you go out and you shoot them frequently in a gun range where it's safe so that you understand how to be able to control it for, for safety because a gun can be used against you if, if, not, if not handled properly. So you've got children that are in distress and you've got us as a culture trying to move like with a crowbar away from traditional values and into modern progress. At what point do people start to realize that progress is the problem? Let me say that again. Progress is the problem. We as human beings cannot handle technology. Our distress started in the modern period and even can show in art with the screen and painting. And painting. That was an overload of just too much of everything that the painters idea was to scream because the color of a sunset was too too much and we see that with autistic children specifically their senses are on overload that they can only take so much information and to me i love the autistic brain most of the geniuses profound geniuses from Einstein to Picasso that we would look at today would be classified on the spectrum. Even Elon Musk just came out by saying he has Asperger's. But, you know, autism allows you to really focus on, on one thing. And there are problems when it gets off the scale where children are being, their senses are so overloaded that they just can't take it. They can't take anything. But that that's, I mean, that's telling you something. The fact that children are born with allergies. I, I tell my students many times that an allergy is your body's way of saying, okay, I've been telling you now four or five times to get that thing away from me. And you still keep it near me. So now I'm going to make it painfully uncomfortable for you and or on the point of death to keep it away from me. So you have children that come out of the womb, which is supposed to be this protective environment for them to be nurtured um, as, as, they, as they grow to be where, you know, the point where they can exit the mother's womb and exist to some degree um, within the, this world. There's something that has happened to them in the womb, um, and it's our food supply, by the way, that has made them so sensitive. That's why they'll either come out sensitive and can't have it until a certain age, until their body learns to cope with it, or it never copes with it. 
and you have people that have very restrictive diets in order to be able to cope with what their body won't let them have. So when you start to look at that, instead of just saying, oh, it's an allergy, I mean, people think the philosopher Heidegger talks about the loss of thinking. Like we see these words, we see these images, we see these symptoms, but we don't really think about what they mean. They mean that our bodies and our minds are not designed for progress, that technology is actually killing us. So simple abundance in the book is a reminder of scaling it back. That progress is not always great. It's looking at your life with a microscope. That's why they encourage journals, whether it's food, um, food journals, if you're trying to lose weight or if you're trying to change your life, like writing things down so that you can take a look at the activities that you've done every day because we get so immersed in the, in the existence that we're in that we're not looking at the individual behaviors that we exhibit that keep us stuck in the same rut of what we were doing before. And the only way to change your life is to start doing different behaviors. The definition of insanity is doing the exact same thing over and over again, expecting different results is the definition of insanity. It doesn't work like that. You have to make minute changes on you, a complex system, in order to be able to, be able to cope with it. And it will cause chaos because you don't even know, you can't plan for what it's going to do when you change your behaviors. But I can almost guarantee you that if you take a step back, it's going to have some chaos. You may have less of an income. You may have to make changes that you can't drive certain places because you don't have enough money. It may mean that you can't see your friends as frequently because you don't have enough money. I mean, the loss of money can also mean significant changes in your lifestyle, but does it have to affect your friends? If your friends are aware of what you're doing, then maybe it's more phone calls than it is going and hanging out and having dinner with someone. Maybe it's coming over to your house and cooking a healthy meal versus going out to a restaurant where you, know, you really don't know what they're putting into the food. Even those that say that they're, they're doing it the right way, may inadvertently buy food in the supply chain that comes with pesticides on it. You just don't know. So the only way to know is to actually do it yourself. And, and one of the things that has profoundly struck me, it goes back to the idea of why we as humans got stuck in this modern notion. And I can even look to my own grandfather on my mother's side who was a sharecropper down in Arkansas and was living in abject poverty. And I remember I said that word to my dad, abject poverty. And, and he was immediately defensive of my grandfather and said, well, that's just not how they were living. And I said, dad, if my grandfather refused to talk about his lifestyle and there's an image of my grandmother out in a hen house, and I know that she would you know, do the old way of, of, of making chicken, which is to go out, find a live one, break its neck, pluck its, its feathers. And there's a certain way of doing that to get the feathers to release that we don't know because we've never done it before. But that's at a subsistence level. Subsistence levels are not easy to live. They didn't own the land as a sharecropper. A sharecropper was that you farmed all the land and you gave up almost 90% of what you, what you raised to the person who owned the land and you kept enough to be able to survive a subsistence level, hard work. But my grandfather was lured to Michigan under the notion of, oh, come work for General Motors, make 60 cents an hour, live in a big city, everything's around here. It's so convenient. Well, what he realized is that giving up this idea of, of working for your food and having the time to do that meant you were working all the time for 60 cents an hour which now means that you had to buy everything because you didn't have the time or you're too exhausted to do your own farming. So 
instead of being able to raise your own food and eat your own food and not have to be beholden to anybody for, you know, you know, how you lived your life. Now you had to work an eight hour to 10 hour shift. You were exhausted when you came home, but you made 60 cents an hour, but you had no time to do your own gardening anymore. You couldn't make your own clothes. Now you had to go buy those. So that 60 cents an hour that you made is now gone for having to buy food, pay your rent, buy clothing, all those things that you used to do with no money really coming in. Whereas back then it was community living. It was, hey, if I raised enough of my crops, I might trade. Like if I had enough carrots, let's say I made, an, I had carrots and I had way too many carrots and I canned the rest of the carrots and I still had carrots galore. I would take those carrots down to the local market or wherever and trade them with someone in my community and say, hey, I need a pair of shoes. So if I give you these carrots for those pair of shoes, would that be an even trade? Well, trade and barter is probably the most profound and ancient method of commerce that's out there. And by the way, the, the, the government can't tax you on trade and barter because it's impossible to tax two different monetized value of items if you trade them because it's desire for the either item and you can't tax desire. Um, although they will try, but that's the ancient form of commerce. It, that's how you, you did it. And that's why your, your, your community was so important and that not everybody did the same thing because you all trade and bartered your way to a comfortable lifestyle. And we look back at ancients and we've been told by people, oh, hard labor, oh, almost slave labor. You know, it wasn't slave labor. That's the modern notion of, oh, anybody who works hard has to be slaving away. No, I now profoundly believe that while they worked hard, that it was not a kind of work hard that they didn't appreciate. They were kept healthy, they may not have lived long lives, but think about it. Would you rather live a long life being anxious and on medication and in a world that makes no sense where they're dropping bombs and kids are shooting things up? Would you really want to live 80 years through that? Or would you rather live 40 years of a comfortable but hard work lifestyle where your community meant things to you? You had your religion, you had your family, you raised your children the right way. They took care of you when you were elderly. Call me silly, but I'd take that. I'd take that lifestyle where it's simplified, where 40 years feels like 80 years because it moves slower. It has more meaning. So that is why I say modern notions, modern technology, modern ideas of progress have failed human beings. And it's now time to wake up. And there are people out there who have felt it. They're the survivalists. They're the people who are vegan and have gone off the grid when it comes to either their food supply and or just off the grid. People who are living in trailers and moving around in small homes. Those are this return to the ancient idea of being migratory, seeing the world, enjoying things, living a simple life, being with somebody who gives you joy, who cares about you as much as you care about them. That is the idea of simple abundance. Not having the JLo's and the Kardashians of the world brag or, you know, I mean, I mean, I love The Rock, but I start to see him more and more for the gimmicks and the marketing that's gotten there. I mean, at what point do we look at the celebrities and say, you're wealth hoarding? Half of what you get, you get for free because people want to be near you. Half of those foundations that they start are just on their name alone. They don't contribute to it. For example, the LeBron James, Nike helps fund his foundations. He gets to put the name on it. He gets to keep his money. There are actually very few, and I've done the research for my dissertation, there are actually very few celebrities that actually contribute their own money to their foundations. More of it comes from corporate sponsors or people who want to buy their influence, who give to their charities, and they get to put on their face on it. They get to 
put out there of all the things that they get to do good. And it helps them with PR. Why not do it? But if you're making and you're worth over a hundred thousand dollars, it's obscene. It is absolutely obscene. Now, I acknowledge that they have the right to do that. They've obviously figured out the capitalistic system on how to be able to work and do that. But if you look at the Rockefellers, the Rockefellers, Standard Oil, John Rockefeller, made all this money through corrupt, uh, ruthless mechanisms for, for, for monopolizing. And then they broke it up, which actually made more money for him. But it was his son who was so traumatized by how he was treated that he actually had John D had a stutter, but his whole life mission came to give his father's money away, which by the way, created more wealth for the family, but at least it was a noble cause. And what we have to understand is the answer isn't, you know, taking someone's money away from them and redistributing their wealth. The answer is to create a structure where they want to give their money away. And how do you do that? You do that to the tax system. You know, I mean, I always laugh when like, the, I think it was Kevin Hart that came out with some devastating earthquake. I think it was in Puerto Rico or a hurricane or something and trying to get all of his fellow celebrities to give a million dollars. And I thought, a million? Really? Like a million. That's all you're going to get when you're worth over a hundred million. That's 0.001% of your wealth. The only reason why you'd cap it at a million is if the tax code only benefited you giving a million dollars. I know that because I've had six figure jobs and I have been told by my accountants, oh, you can't give that away. If you give it away, you're not going to get, you know, any kind of tax credit for doing that. I still give it away because the idea isn't that I give away things for, for a tax credit. I give it away because it's the right thing to do. But a celebrity who's so focused on money will only give the amount of money that they can get back on their tax returns. So while you think it's, it's, it's taxing them more, taking their wealth away that they've learned and earned, and, and you would as well. And that's what I find is hypocritical. Many of the people who are, even in my own family, who claim to be socialists, who are screaming about government paying things, when they inherit money, do they give it back to either members in their own family that need that money? No, I've got relatives that are about buying Louis Vuitton handbags with their inheritance, traveling the world with their inheritance while one of their siblings' kids are struggling. But they're socialists because they want the government to redistribute your wealth, not themselves. But you try taking that money and it will be out of their cold, dead hand because it's always good to be a socialist when the government, but it's never a good to be a socialist when it's someone's asking you to give your money away. So I can't blame a celebrity on some levels for wanting to keep the money that they've worked hard for. But on the other hand, if the government is gonna do anything or the community should be doing things, it's to press them to give their money away for good. Helping, like truly helping, calling them out when they're not giving their money away Stop buying their products if they're not actually doing, their money should be at a certain cap level. I can't remember, and I'll find the name of this person and I'll put it in the podcast, but there's a billionaire from the 1980s who um, made his money on the duty-free shops, who ultimately decided to give his money away. Do you know it took him from the 1980s until about five years ago to give $6 billion away? That's how much a billion is. We don't know that. So to a celebrity, a million dollars is nothing. To us, it's everything. I shouldn't say us because I don't consider if I had a million dollars, I'd probably keep enough to be comfortable. Um, I, it's not like I want to live in a luxurious mansion or anything like that. Um, I'd rather, I, I, I profoundly feel the effects of giving my money away or giving my time more importantly away and watching the gratitude on someone's face when you help them out. To me, there is no better drug out there for making someone feel better than when you give your time and you give your money away to someone who really needs it.
that look on their face, that hug that you get from them, the tears they shed in gratitude. And I've been in that place before where even $50 made me cry because I had nothing. So I know that feeling of pure gratitude when somebody gives you something that you didn't have when you were struggling. And that's why I'm on this being paleo, which is to explore art, philosophy, lifestyle. And I've decided to bring my business into it since there is a way to be able to monetize and teach people to do better in their lives. Um, and those will be for different podcasts, but it will all now be under being paleo because I have just, I've, I've gotten tired of, I've, I'm tired of corruption. I'm tired of selfishness. It is better to be selfless than selfish. And yet I see selfishness everywhere and I'm tired of it. I, so this is my stand to help other people return to a simple abundance um, and help people in any way that I can with the knowledge that's in my head. So I thank you for listening today to this podcast and hopefully you go out and buy the book, Simple Abundance and begin that journey of trying to use a tool, which is the book um, to help you begin to create some structure for yourself and changing your life. And hopefully you, you know, please subscribe. Um, I'll have more videos as I, and, and on podcasts as I go through this journey of things that either interest me or bother me um, and trying to correct things that I see uh, by looking at things and asking more questions and really trying to understand ancient people from, from a lens that we don't have anymore. We've so far lost what they have done that you can't even look back at what they've done and, and even the archeologists I believe have gotten it wrong. And I know that's, that's a pretty bold statement, but when you start to really reflect on things as I have, as what I am now, I consider myself to be an artist philosopher, um, you can look back at things and you can watch certain philosophers as I'm using in my dissertation, start to talk about modernism and how destructive it has been in, in every area of a human being's existence. That at some point I have asked that question of, is modern, this modern notion of how we live our lives, is it good? And the answer has become for me, no, it's not. It's not good in our food supply. It's not good in our lifestyles. It's not good in politics. It's not good at all. And how do we get away from that? And how can I get more people involved in this, this, this movement away from what it is that we call modern and returning to a healthier lifestyle in mind, body, and spirit. So thank you for joining me today and uh, have a great day being paleo.